to Robert Kennedy Jr. Um, and initially and all this stuff. And and it, to me, it's one of the most important topics because it's a perfect example of censorship. It's a perfect example of government getting into your personal lives. And you're seeing it now where it's like you, you know, and this is why this election, I almost felt like was a one topic or one issue election, because I, I, I looked at everybody. It didn't matter if you're a liberal conservative or, you know, libertarian, anarcho libertarian socialist. I'm like, does anybody like the way things are right now? If nobody likes the way things are right now, then unfortunately, if you vote for Joe Biden, things might just get worse, you know, and it, it just to me, it, it, it's been very frustrating every week doing these shows. And you see, you know, you talk to people from all over the world, all over the country, and everybody is just upset because it's it's one of those things where, you know, I've said this on the show before when you're talking about foreign policy, like and, and you know, some people can lose interest in that because they get to go to to dinner they get to go on with their lives it doesn't affect them that much if we're in syria or not it affects some people but the average american it doesn't but these issues are affecting everybody and it's seeping into i mean there's just a a story recently about uh giving 11 year olds consent in dc a bill that they're trying to pass where they can get a vaccine in school without their parents knowing i mean it, it's insanity and the, there's there's no question about it and um I think Big Pharma is no lover of this president because of his drive for lower drug prices. So they were out to mug him. There's no question about that. I'm a I'm a a anti vaccination. I'm not a scientist or a doctor. It seems to me to be not the vaccination itself, but what's in it that is um, uh, this potentially dangerous. But I'm against any mandatory policy. And I I'm very skeptical of this rush to a vaccination. Uh, for COVID-19, which would be the first vaccination that actually changes your DNA in ways that I think is, are dangerous. Uh, and I, who I really admire enormously is Robert Kennedy Jr. Uh, because he comes from an establishment family. Uh, he's a person I think of enormous integrity. Uh, he's an environmentalist. Um, he has stepped forward and taken this fight on. He's been denounced by members of his own family, but that's too bad because he's right. Uh, and he's been very, very courageous about it. I admire his leadership. Um, I liked, um, you know, his father was a man of great courage as well. Uh, staunch anti-communist, worked for Joe McCarthy, actually. Part of the Robert F. Kennedy Sr. narrative they don't tell you. But um, uh, one of the Kennedy sisters dated Joe McCarthy. Joe McCarthy was a uh, was in the bridal party when uh, Bobby Kennedy married Ethel. Um, Robert Kennedy was the only Senate Democrat to attend Joe McCarthy's funeral. Very interesting. You know, since we've got Roger Stone here and he just uh, mentioned the vaccines, I was wondering what your take is on Andrew Cuomo in New York. Now that the New York State Bar Association has said it will be mandatory in New York to take this uh, COVID-1984 vaccine, especially because the media pre-election and post-election almost made Cuomo Trump's foil and not Biden. So what are your thoughts on that, Roger? Um, I agree with that analysis. Um, I I think the governor is a real liability in his own actions. I mean, I was at the bookstore the other day, and I see that Andrew Cuomo has written a book on leadership, which is extraordinary, given what we know uh, about um, the, uh, the assignment of people who were infected or people who could be affected to nursing homes. This looks like a mass murder to me, a mishandling of the situation. The governor sought to blame everybody else or gloss over it, praising his own leadership. Um, I don't think that's an accurate depiction of what has transpired, but the mainstream media narrative required the Trump is fumbling the COVID-19 response, which I think is creating. At the end of the day, Joe, all, despite Joe Biden's puffing and puffing, virtually everything he's proposing in his new task force has already been done, except the annihilation of our economy and our social fabric, which they would also like, and I think is a mistake at this juncture. Yeah, it, seem, it seems like in order for Donald Trump to actually uh, win in terms of now now that we're in this stage that we're of the fight right now, and it seems like what he would have to do is obviously get the will of the people and not just necessarily his base, but also some people outside of his base. And being a libertarian, I uh, I I was a hardcore Trump supporter in 2016. Sort of embarrassed to say a little bit. I was a 
liber- Ron Paul libertarian guy, then voted for Gary Johnson, and then went to, went pushed for uh, the president in 2016. Had a Donald Trump. I mean, bought a signed hat before the election. I mean, I listened to every single one of your shows in 2016 on Alex Jones. Listened to Alex Jones every day for like five or six years. Right. I stopped. I stopped after the election, though, because it came it became nothing about Trump. It became everything about Trump afterwards. But anyways, he didn't win my vote this time because I saw that there's so many areas in terms of my big thing is economics. And I saw that he had Gary Cohn on as his first economic advisor. And then, I mean, I don't need to get too much into that. He had Jerome Powell. And the day he picked Jerome Powell, I knew that for me, my main issue was the Federal Reserve and then seeing a swamp monster like him. Uh, anyways, not to tie up this whole the whole big thing with all these great people on, but I think what what... I'm just wondering if he could throw us like like a bone and maybe one way to help galvanize us would be get like freeing like like Ross Ulbrich and or having like Julian Assange getting a pardon for him because if he really wants to energize this uh, this base of all these people who uh you know want to be able to support him I mean I just want to see if he can throw us a bone and and actually the day after you were hit with the Ryerson attack you were supposed to be on Ernest Hancock's show and unfortunately you I mean obviously you had the no show because you were in the hospital and I I filled in for you that day to talk about Taneo uh and I gave you and I actually made like a one minute thank you because I thought that you and uh actually at the time Drudge I mean obviously now he's not a fan of the president but I thought that you Alex Jones and Drudge are probably the on the Mount Rushmore of people that were MVPs of the election and I never got to give you that one minute thank you uh but if but if trump wants to help out some of the people to help get him there but part of that thank you was i was inspired that that other people like me who created a page out of nowhere and was reached like a million people right before the election i created a page right before the election reached over a million people and then boom right after the election i got shadow banned 99 percent reach uh, kicked off of youtube and and the fact the president's done nothing believe me i get it but i mean I, i think the problem here is that as a libertarian as a believer in the free market you got to finish the story. Yes, Trump did have Gary Cohen, a Wall Street guy, a globalist, somebody who doesn't understand growth economics, but he was dismissed. And the president, I think, brought in the most dynamic member of the Trump team, Larry Kudlow, who is does have libertarian instincts. Um, and they're the ones who unleashed this mountain of tax cuts and regulatory cuts, which as anti-government conservatives, libertarian conservatives, I, I think that that is a, a, an extraordinary thing. Now, uh, along comes COVID. Uh, Trump is not a scientist. He's not a doctor. The doctors around him who are all establishment corrupted, uh, basically uh, given these draconian projections of how many will die if he doesn't shut the economy down. He errs on the side of caution because he doesn't know. Um, thank God their projections are wrong. But you can see why he wouldn't want to rely on them a second time to shut down the economy, uh, which is, uh, I think, uh, uh, interesting in itself. Yeah, well, as part of that story, I was I was on Facebook in 2004, and the very first show that I said that I liked uh, was Larry Kudlow because I was watching him at 14 years old. And the problem with Larry Kudlow is as soon as he, he becomes a, a company guy and then he switches a lot of his stances just – to become pro-Trump, and he actually backed away from a lot of things. And then also, I mean, Trump, there was 16 times during the election or, or even more during the uh, run-up in 2016 where he said the economic numbers are fake, and he was talking about the jobs numbers and said these job numbers are the most fa- folk fake, phony numbers that have ever been existed just to make presidents, politicians, and economists look good. And so the fact that he was speaking my language and then flipped it, yeah, if you're using the same rigged numbers, he did make the rigged numbers look good, except then he flipped the script. And so that, for someone that actually knows the numbers, I was doing presentations on this before COVID hit, so I don't blame him for the COVID stuff. And it's not that, it's just that even a guy like Larry Kudlow completely changes his tune, uh, you know, because once, I mean, he was a big critic of the president, and then he gets in there, and then all of a sudden now, uh, now he starts you know, basically carrying the bags, you know, for, for Trump on certain things. He, but, you know. but he has been the spark plug. He's been the apostle of the pro-growth uh, policies that have really made the whole nucleus of the success of Trump's presidency, um, I think is attributable to his to the president's chosen jockey, who is not the Wall Street corporatist that you mentioned earlier, because that was a horrific appointment. It's hard to understand. Uh, I kind of like your story because it's similar to mine. The last vote I cast in a Republican statewide primary for president was for Ron Paul. Then um, when the Republican Party nominated Mitch, Mitt Romney, I knew what he really was. I just couldn't stomach it. So I supported Governor Gary Johnson. Um, you know, it's hard to leave the Republican Party. It's the traditional home of Goldwater, Reagan, Nixon. I mean, I have a sentimental uh, 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 feeling for the party. I was a young Republican national chairman. 
I went to become a libertarian. Part of would have stayed there uh, until Donald Trump staged the, you know, essentially a hostile takeover of the Republican Party, making my return, you know, possible. So I think the parties changed forever. In other words, I, this is not about really whether the president survives or whether he gets another term. He has started a revolution that is not going to go away. Uh, so now they have to censor that revolution because it's a uh, reform is dangerous to the system. Roger, like the Roger, can I ask you then if you really think it's going to change, for instance, what are your thoughts on somebody like John Bolton, who you've spoken favorably above about uh, in the past, you know, basically telling him to throw in the towel, concede. Um, yeah. and, and I would say I would argue his base, Trump's base, was never in favor of an a Bolton appointment. What, what are your thoughts on him? Um, having known Bolton personally, um, I now recognize that I had misjudged him. First of all, um, I know him to be very able. What I never understood was whether he was just uh, an able um, uh, executor of a plan uh, or whether he was, um, uh, you know, able to... Uh, do this in a way that that worked. Um, I have lost faith based on additional evidence um, that he is able to do so. So um, yes, I did. I did speak. I guess hopefully of him at one point, but it has not borne fruit in terms of my expectations. Hello, Roger, everyone. I know you have a, a hard out in about five or ten minutes. Um, we started off the, the panel here talking about censorship and talking about the crackdown on free speech. Uh, you you kind of obfuscated to the FBI the nature of your relationship with Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. No, um, I never spoke to the FBI, so. Or uh, the, the Flynn investigation. I, I, I read the transcript. I never spoke to the Flynn investigation. Um, but what, 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 whatever you were testifying on where the transcripts got leaked and we all got to read them and it was fantastic reading. Um, right. Isn't it isn't it more important now than at any other point that we collectively stand up for Julian Assange and for WikiLeaks? Because the precedent that it would set going forward is that any journalist or publisher, no matter where they are, no matter where they live, who receives classified information or goes to protect a source or publishes classified information can be extradited to the U.S., yes. thrown in a black hole for 175 years for printing vital information to the public. Uh, uh, so, yes, let me address that. First of all, I'm, I'm not surprised you didn't see this, but at midnight on Election Day, midnight, the busiest media day of the year, the Department of Justice released the last previously redacted sections of the yeah. Mueller report regarding Roger Stone, which proves that they had no evidence whatsoever that I conspired with Julian Assange. Right. They had any right. knowledge. I think, and I've gone on the record to say, Assange is a journalist. The claim that he's a Russian asset, I just don't believe we've ever seen proof of that. It's just an assertion of John Brennan uh, and, the, and the deep state. I think, interestingly, nothing Assange has ever published has been challenged in terms of its authenticity or its accuracy, which you can't say for the New York Times. Um, they can't uh, prosecute him, I think, under the New York Times um, uh, versus United States case for the publication of uh, classified information, but that's his real infraction. So they go and construct these charges against him in which he's accused of hacking. But when you look at their case, it's not clear that he hacked anybody. Uh, it, is a great, it is a great travesty. Uh, on the other hand, you have Mike Pompeo saying that he is a state actor, which I don't believe to be the case. Uh, he played a, uh, inadvertently, I think, a significant role in the uprising that elected Trump. So, yes, I have written several um, op-eds on this. I think the president should pardon him. I wish that he would. 